This is Apocalypse Book Club. I want to talk about Sam Harris today. You've got people who are passionate and dedicated to what they believe. And then you get Sam Harris. Basically, okay, Sam Harris is someone that I think has set philosophy back for all of his fans and even for everybody that's engaging with him for a variety of reasons. I think the first reason is that he's trying to invent his own style, which I would call like the imaginary scenario style of philosophy. Dial up the deadliness of the pathogen. Bodies of kids are being stacked up in parks and we have a vaccine that actually works and then we've got RFK Jr. saying maybe you don't want to get the jab. He says imagine a scenario and children and, are and, and dying. children are dying and being popped in the street. Now RFK is saying don't do it? Like no no no. RFK was talking about now you made up a fake scenario in your own mind and then criticized RFK. That I mean I don't know if he's the first one to ever use it but like he th seems to think that this is like what philosophers do or he thinks this is an advance based on like what we previously had but it's neither you know you don't just create these imaginary scenarios and i want to explain what i mean and everybody has been like kind of ragging on sam harris lately dave smith he said imagine if everything was completely different then things would be different well i think what's strange is the mental gymnastics he has to go through to create a scenario where the, the world that he wants is correct which is good because i think if you think about it it's like how do we actually do peer review one way is that there's like three peer reviewers these magical peer reviewers at journals that now even people like richard dawkins and peter Peter Bogosian are like saying, you know, there actually are problems with peer review. Or they'll, if they're knowledgeable and they're an academic, they'll talk about literature, the peer reviewed literature. And that peer reviewed literature has been, when I've written about before, it's been idea laundered. So you get a bunch of people who are ideologues together uh, who already, they start with their conclusion first and they work backward from the conclusion, the exact opposite of science. So they Brett Weinstein says there's problems with peer review. Everybody, uh, Jan LeCun said, like, the AI guy, he said, who invented, like, deep learning, partly. He was always critical of the peer review process because the peer review process turned down deep learning in the early days. And so it's basically like, if we're not going to do peer review the traditional way, which is kind of good because I think it's just, like, very slow, then the question is, how do we do peer review as an internet community? And I think, ideally, when someone was proved wrong, they would admit the point. But Sam Harris won't do that. If he's not going to admit the point, he could at least go and do interviews or podcasts with people where they actually discuss whether or not it's true what he says. For example, the one thing that I'm always on Sam Harris about is that he said that we can get values from science. We can get values from facts. Yeah, well, uh, I should preface this by saying this is a very controversial opinion. Uh, I think... No, it, that's why I bring it yeah, up. It, 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 <laughs> it, it, I don't think it should be, but it, it is. And it's been part of uh, modern philosophy from, like, since Hume, which was like 300 years ago, that you can't get an ought from an is, which is like a linguistic argument. And it's a good argument. And I would update it using modern logic. That's going to be the contribution that I want to make in my book, AI Philosophy. So we want to update Hume's argument. There's more things we could say. We could bring in decision theory, or we could bring in artificial intelligence perspectives, and all of these would contradict what Sam Harris is saying. And so there's ways we can modernize Hume's argument that you can't get an ought from an is. But that's just like deepening the insight that he already had. So Hume is one of the major philosophers of the English language. And yeah, he's like definitely one of the greats. There's not that many people really that have been great philosophers in the last 2,500 years. I actually think it's less than 25. I would say there's probably been less than one great philosopher every century. So in some sense, we don't like, it, it doesn't make sense for everyone to try to be a philosopher at once. Like not, at least not a great philosopher. Everyone needs some philosophy. And then like, there's like ways to apply things and different scenarios and ways to mix things like Ty Lopez is kind of a great philosopher because he's like a philosopher of life and he's mixing all these different perspectives and he does have new stuff controversial take you should try to make your body look specifically whatever is most attractive to the opposite sex but these kind of fundamental insights that come from people like Hume, they don't come very often. And so for Sam Harris to disagree with Hume, you have to, like it's he's one of the, you know he's one of the standards I think, I, mean, I think courtesy of Hume, we have drawn the lesson in, we, in, in Western philosophy and science that facts and values are two different classes of thing. He's one of the people in the canon. You, you can't just like dismiss Hume and say, well, Hume said this, but I don't think so. You have to give a reason. This is like 101. Okay, so if you think Hume was wrong, that's what he said the other day with Vinod Kosli. He was invited for some kind of after dinner event with Sam Harris, where I guess like the idea is like, you know, talk about some ideas, which is in theory a fun thing. <laughs> but the problem is Sam Harris doesn't know what he's talking about. And Vinod Kosla, who's a VC, he's an engineer, an entrepreneur and stuff. Even he knows the issue better than Sam Harris. And, he, you know, Sam Harris just like rambles on every time Vinod asks a question and then 
then he doesn't answer the question of Vinod, Vinod Kosla, the entrepreneur, VC, not full-time philosopher. Vinod Kosla, who understands the issue better, keeps trying to like prompt Sam Harris and prompt Sam Harris, and he keeps missing the point. And it's crazy, but one thing that Sam Harris said in the middle of this um, interview was like, he says, okay, Hume said you can't get an ought from an is, which is true. He's like, but I don't think we need to play these language games. I, 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 think, I think that the concept of should, the, the linking of morality and questions of right and wrong and good and evil to, to questions about should and ought is a, a language game I don't think we have to play. So basically, that's how he argues away what Hume is saying. He's like, we don't need to play these language games. And then that's it. And then he just starts talking about like random stuff. And it's like, I think Sam Harris fans, unfortunately, like they, they don't realize that Sam Harris is just rambling on. Like they think that because Sam Harris talks for 20 minutes that he's answering the question. And this is bad. Sam Harris shouldn't be teaching people this. It's like philosophers reach conclusions about important issues. You know what I mean? And Sam Harris, it's like, he just talks and talks and he likes to have these conversations that don't go anywhere. You know, he just likes to see his like face on people's podcasts and he likes to be invited to dinner parties and stuff like that but it's not really what philosophy is about philosophy is about answering questions like in a concrete way like Hume did when he said there's no ought from an is and um yeah I mean like I think you know you could add a bunch of math to this argument but the intuition of what Hume is saying is like basically there's like what is and what we should do about it and so if you have a like science which is a database of like facts that are have the verb is or does like for example the sun does rise in the east or you could say the sun is something that rises in the east so is and does i would say those are like the main verbs or probably does right like um it probably does rain during the rainy season it probably doesn't rain not in the rainy season, right is and does are the main verbs of science now when you want to talk about action or making a decision now all of a sudden you're talking about what should we do in such and such a situation or a context given a situation or a context what should we do so basically if you have a database of sentences where the verb is is or does i think that's why Hume just says is, but like is and does are similar. Is or does, that's like science is like a database of facts or potential facts or theories, all of which have the verb is or does. So now when you want to make a statement of like we should do X, Y, Z, you can't, you can't have a conclusion that says we should do something if all of the sentences in your database are using the verbs is or does. And so Sam Harris wants to just brush aside Hume, who first of all is right, second of all is one of the great philosophers of all time, and third of all has always been recognized as being right on this issue and so if you were <laughs> going to deconstruct Hume you'd have to do it in a very serious way you don't just say you don't just brush it off and that's basically what Sam Harris does do is he says well Hume said you can't get an ought from an is but I don't think we need to play this language game I, I think I think that the concept of should the, the linking of morality and questions of right and wrong and good and evil to, to questions about should and ought is a, a language game I don't think we have to play right so I, I think if you just leave that aside. That's what he says. We don't have to play this language game. Now, the word language game is from Wittgenstein, and it refers to the idea that when we are using language in our everyday lives, it's kind of like we're playing a game. And so then language is kind of like a tool, and this leads to a whole interpretation of language. And the word language game, the way that Wittgenstein said, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with the word language game. The problem is Sam Harris just hears the word language game, uses it in a way that it's not supposed to be used. Like He's not referring to a language game the way that it is of like what are we using language as a tool to do so according to Wittgenstein who introduced the word language game language game refers to a form of human activity in which language is used each language game involves a set of rules and conventions that govern how language is employed within a particular context so the word language game does make sense but not the way Sam Harris is using it he's using it as though like basically just in a very sophistry kind of a way like everything that he does like I don't even know exactly what he means by it's a language game we don't have to play I, I think I think that the concept of should, the, the linking of morality and questions of right and wrong and good and evil to, to questions about should and ought is a a language game I don't think we have to play. I mean, I, you know, that's what he always does is he says these things that sound smart, but they don't really like mean a precise thing. So if by the language game, you mean like the fact that we're doing science, like in philosophy, like philosophy and science are a language game. Is that the game we don't need to play? Like philosophy and science? Like, isn't that your whole game? Like, it's like, I don't know, like, I, what to really say about this sentence? It's a crazy sentence. It's a language game we don't need to play. Like, it's a language game that we do need to play because we want to form sentences that have the word should in them. So how do we not play this language game, Sam Harris? But even so, I, I just, I think the main thing to say about this sentence is that it's just, it's sophistry because it doesn't really mean anything. And he's just taking a, a word that sounds cool and putting in a sentence. And this is why I think Michael Schellenberger on with Brett Weinstein the other day called Sam Harris childlike. You know, Sam has a very wrong core worldview 
um, that is sort of astonishing in its simplicity and childlike nature. Because it's like, he just takes the word language game that he heard somewhere and it sounded cool. And then he says it on stage and he's like, I'll say the word language game, but language game means something. Is a, a language game I don't think we have to play. It means a precise thing, according to Wittgenstein or whoever you mean. But the point is, first of all, he doesn't define language game. He just says like language game, you know? And I don't even know if he's trying to be sophist, sophist, sophistry or like to use sophistry or if he just doesn't even know what he's doing or both. I think it's probably both. But I, I think the first thing I really want to say is like, you cannot dismiss Hume with this nonsensical argument. Hume is right. He's a landmark in the field. And this argument doesn't make any sense. Okay, so then Sam Harris like blabbers on and on and he probably talks for like 20 minutes in this interview and I saw a mom with Lex Friedman complaining that people take him out of context. Sam Harris is concerned that people take him out of context but it's like it's because you talk for 20 minutes and you don't answer the question and like it's well known even in pop culture it's almost like funny how many people are remarking on this now that Sam Harris talks in these like word salad style of arguments where he just talks for like 20 minutes. Mark Andreessen he called it word salad. He said that Sam Harris creates a chain of hypotheticals with no data attached to it. He just like, he's like, imagine this, imagine, it's like the John Lennon song, imagine, like that's what Sam Harris does. He's just like, well, imagine this, imagine that. And the problem with this imaginary scenario style is that like, yes, philosophers do imagine assumptions and, le and then examine the conclusions, but the assumptions have to be relevant. And so that's what Tim Poole and Dave Smith and even Tristan Tate, <laughs> the philosopher Tristan Tate, they were all getting on Sam Harris for this recently because he has this imaginary scenario about vaccines where like the death rate is higher than it is and even I think the effective rate is higher than it is and if both there was way more death and children were dying and the vaccine was perfectly effective then it would make sense for everyone to take it. Dial up the deadliness of the pathogen. Bodies of kids are being stacked up in parks and we have a vaccine that actually works and then we've got RFK Jr. saying maybe you don't want to get the jab. He says imagine a scenario and children, and, are, and, and dying. children are dying and being piled in the street. Now RFK is saying don't do it? Like No, no, no. RFK was talking about now you made up a fake scenario in your own mind and then criticized RFK. Well, that's not the scenario that we're in. So, you know, like the, the point of philosophy is to find assumptions that are relevant and show that those assumptions lead to conclusions that are relevant. And that's not what Sam Harris is doing. But basically then, okay, so, he, so he's dismissed Hume with a flimsy argument. That's like major error. That would be a fail for a paper right there. This was peer review. But let's keep going with the interview. And then Sam Harris, trying to refute Hume, this 300 year old result, says, yes, we can derive morality or, va or values from science because all we need to do is imagine the, <laughs> there's that word again, imagine, imagine the worst possible outcome for everyone. We want to avoid that. So this is the crux of his argument after having not really dismissed Hume. This is basically what he's come up with. So this is wrong in so many ways. First of all, I think it's wrong because he said he was going to derive values from facts, from science, but he hasn't derived, <laughs> he hasn't used science in this. This is a purely philosophical argument. And the whole point of the moral landscape was how science can determine human value. So that's a big problem. He's kind of like changed his argument because it was supposed to be science that we're going to use science to determine values. Now, I'm not saying that we don't use science to determine what we do, but the thing is we use science and our values to determine what we do. We don't get the values from science. So the first problem is he didn't use science. That was his big thing is that science was going to determine the values. Is we were going to get the values from the world, but he's not getting it from the world. He's just using a philosophical argument that would be true in any world. It doesn't depend on our actual world. So he's not using science to determine values when he says, imagine a world or just imagine the worst outcome for everyone. The second is, this is not complete. You know, like, what do we do? Even if you were to grant that the rest of this makes sense, which it doesn't, we already know that we don't want the best, the worst possible world for everyone. But within that space of things that are not the worst possible world for everyone, there's still an infinite number of things we need to make decisions about. And this theory doesn't cover that. Finally, I guess this is related to the first point that I made. He is introducing values. He's saying we don't want the worst possible outcome for everyone. Well, why not? Did you get that from science? No, he's not appealing to science. He's appealing to his own philosophy. So he's disproving himself in a third way <laughs> related to the first because he actually just is introducing values, which is we don't want the worst possible outcome for everybody. Well, that's a value and that didn't come from science. So you disproved yourself again. So basically in summary, Sam Harris proposed to change a result by Hume without explaining why Hume is wrong. Hume is right. And then his own explanation of what he's trying to do doesn't make any sense because he said, 
said, we want to avoid the worst possible outcome for everyone. Well, first of all, we already know that. We don't need like a big brain philosopher to tell us we don't want the worst possible world for everybody. Nobody even talked about creating the worst possible world for everybody. Obviously, somebody's trying to, everybody, the, the default is that everyone's trying to maximize their own world. And then the Christian assumption or the sort of um, higher order love based assumption is that we want to do the best for everybody. So the sort of choices are between doing the best for yourself and doing the best for your community, doing the best for the entire universe, or just doing the best for yourself. Nobody, it's not even like a relevant question whether we would want to do the, the worst possible thing for everybody. But even if we did, that's still a value. So I think the main thing that Sam Harris has contributed is that he's drawn attention to this question so we can consider it anew. Can you get values from science? And since the answer is no, then the question is, where do the values come from? And the two answers are they're either subjective and we make up our own values or they're objective and we have to seek the values outside of ourselves. But they can't come from science. Sam Harris didn't explain what the, pro what the problem with Hume was. He didn't offer his own coherent theory. The theory that he offered is actually incoherent. So he's wrong about this. But more generally, I think the important point is how does the internet bring someone to justice <laughs> when they just want to admit that they're wrong? Like a gentleman or a gentlewoman or a gentle person. Sam Harris won't be a gentleman and just say, you know, I put out this theory, it's called the moral landscape, but it was actually completely off. Sorry about that, my mistake, let's move on. But he won't do that. And until he does that, I think, you know, it is appropriate to mock him because it's like Sam Harris fans who are a little on the slower side, they're just watching his videos and being like, oh wow, this is what philosophy is, but this is not what philosophy is. So I think it's important that some way we use stern language to communicate to Sam Harris that, you know, he's wrong and he should admit that he's wrong. And until he admits that he's wrong, I I agree that the internet should be putting pressure on Sam Harris and um, yeah, till he, till he admits his mistake.